Well, let's go to session three, Gospel According to Marriage. Uh, now we're going to, there is going to be some talk now to husbands and wives, but guys, I pray that this doesn't feel in any way like a beat, a beat down that we wanted to tell you we wanted to avoid last night. So that we're going to spend some time in Ephesians here. And I, I want to try to include a couple visuals um, that I think will carry a lot of the, the instruction uh, that we'll look at here um, and completely related to, to the scriptures. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you so much for this time together. Uh, Lord, we do. We just really that just that honor marriage. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And we're just getting a glimpse into why it is so fantastic and so magnificent and why you would receive such global glory through it. God, we've also seen that, that though we want to be faithful with our day, that you're seeing this as generations. And God, oh, it's so exciting, so exciting to think of kids growing up, gospel centrality, seeing the gospel in mom and dad, that, and that they go and do the same thing. Um, Lord, taking your word and your gospel in both word, proclamation, as well as indeed the demonstration of the gospel in marriage. So please help us, Lord. We love you. Pray you'd refresh everybody. Uh, please fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might learn everything you want to put on our hearts. Change us as we're learning and growing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, well, you know, I did want to mention that, so we talk about, man, how horrific it would have felt to have fallen. Adam and Eve have eaten the fruit. Um, seems like Satan had won, right? Uh, hopeless and dark because all that awaited them to their knowledge was judgment. So, you know, and we talked about, and God overcame that with the promise of the Messiah, promise made, right? Promise made. So be thinking, if you want to read your Old Testament, promises made, New Testament promises kept, right? Promises made, promises kept. Well, there was a darker day than that one, right? God overcame that dark day, right? With the promise of Messiah. The other dark day was when Jesus was hanging on the cross. That was the darkest day in human history. Because to all appearances, the one who supposedly was the Messiah is dying, not just dying, but cursed, cursed on the tree. So can you imagine you followed him for three years? Is Satan more powerful than God? Did, did, did evil win? Does, does the governmental forces of mankind overrule the work of God? Oh. It's, it's just, we, we, did we waste three years of our life? It looks like the darkest day. All the hopes of, of, of every heart that had, had dared believe that this was a Messiah seemed to be dashed. Disciples e e abandoning Jesus in his darkest hour. And yet, even though the world is saying, prove that, prove that you're Messiah, get off the cross, <laughs> right? Come prove that you're Messiah. And essentially what Jesus said was, I'm going to prove that I'm the Messiah by staying on the cross. And guys, if he, if he endured, the, the worst day in Jesus's life was to prepare you so that he, you would know he's with you on the worst day of your life, right? God resurrects him from the dead on the third day and Oh my goodness, suddenly the darkest day in history was actually part of the plan of God to save us from our sins and to give us new life in him, you know. So keep those things in mind. I think I've got to, I've got to do that. When, when I'm going through struggles, when I'm worried with something with Jan and I, when I'm worried about my kids and my grandkids, when I'm worried about you as our church family, I need some pretty, pretty easy places to look quickly to remember God is in control. And God was in control from the very beginning when men fell, promise made, blood shed, skin given, righteous covering given, but way better, promise kept. If Jesus did that, he's going to bring you through anything. He's going he's to bring your kids through anything because he already won the biggest victory there. Okay. 
So let's keep that in mind as we're looking at God to keep teaching us more specific things in terms of husbands and wives. Um, and as we're going to read here about the instruction uh, to both husbands and wives, uh, I want you to notice something. And I think this this came to me through that the book that you guys just got. The, uh, I think it's Van, Van Dixorn, I think is the guy's name. I th- he and his wife wrote it. But isn't it interesting that God has made all of the instruction to a husband visible to the wife. <laughs> Sounds like duh, right? But And all of the instruction of the wife, the husband has complete access to. And now in our sinful dispositions, that's been dangerous. Because have you ever heard the phrase sharpen your elbow? You know, I, there was, I was at a service one time and the preacher said, because you get to talk about husbands and wives. He says, so wives don't go sharpening your elbow. When I'm talking to your husbands, meaning, right? Are you getting this? You know, <laughs> kind of a thing. That's why we've done that. We've 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 spent more time trying to hold our spouse accountable for what they're doing, and we typically do that in very dictatorial ways, very ugly ways um, that God never intended. And this was brilliant. Why, Glenn? Why does God want you to read what He's calling? Um, I know, I'm just trying to think, am I, am I going the right direction here? Yeah. So Lynn, why would God want you to know everything he's calling Leah to do? So that I would have that perspective that a woman would do things for me. Yeah, you're, I mean, you know, you're, you're going in totally. You're going the right direction. You know what we're supposed to be doing as husbands? I mean, use this word. It's not the best word. But we're supposed to be helping our wives be successful at what God's calling them to. Wives, you're supposed to be helping your husbands be successful. So what does that mean? That means I should be living a life. Jan's called to respect me. And I, so many ways, I'm not respectable. She's called to, to respect me. I'm reading that. She's called to submit to me. I'm reading that. What should that tell me? Dear God, please help me make her successful at that. Please, God, let me grow in respectability, even though you've got to do that anyway, because it's unto the Lord. You're not just reacting to me. But I want to spend the remaining years of our marriage making that easier for you. I want, I want, I want to make you more successful at submitting and respecting because of, of just what God wants me to be to make you thrive and flourish. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way. I think that's the coolest way to be thinking about how to read the verses about your wife, husbands, and how to read the verses about your wives. Am I repeating? (laughs) Husbands to wives, wives to husbands. So let's open the scriptures and let's look what God is now saying. He's already taught us Ephesians 1 through 4. And now he's, he's saying, now let's talk application here. And one of the ways he's talking application is in Ephesians 5. Uh, Let's begin with uh, wives in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church is submitted to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, for this reason, shall man leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. 
However, let each of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So let's, let's dig into that. Um, uh, the Christ-like love of a husband uh, is accountable. And one little note there, I just kind of was, was already saying. So be reading this with a desire to want to inspire your spouse to be what God's calling them to be, not require it. Require it can go into, you know, you want to, you want them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. You want them to walk in obedience to scripture, but, but we're to be inspiring them to be what God wants them to be. And not, they're not under our thumb. They don't wanna, um, they, they've got to give an account to God about this. We want to inspire them. We want to point this, point them to the smiling face of the Lord. So what a great thing that the, the Lord makes, there's, there's accountability in this. Uh, so the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is also the head of the church. Verse 23, indicative, imperative things. That's a, it's important when you're reading your Bible. Know the difference between an indicative statement and an imperative statement. Indicative statement is a statement of fact. We don't make it happen. God has made it happen. It's true by its very nature. It's already established. This is something that God has done. Why is that important? Because a man does not make himself the head. Uh, but I think sinful tendencies would say, I'm the head, which makes me better, right? That's not the kingdom of God. Just because you have a leadership role never equates that with being more important or better, right? There's equality with distinctive roles. God made the husband the head of the wife, and that's with an accountability factor, as Christ is also the head of the church. You're not, you don't get to be the head. You don't get to be the leader and just do it your way. This is not a Frank Sinatra thing. This is, this is how did Christ do it? And that's how I am called to do it. So he's not the head because he's more valuable or because his role is more valuable. Husband and wife equal with specific redemptive roles. Uh, spiritual headship, this is in your notes, is not about being the boss of two separate people. It's being responsible for the spiritual welfare of a husband and wife who are united to Christ in the covenant of salvation and united to each other in the covenant of marriage. Spiritual leadership is not trying to control someone, but to serve someone toward the goal of becoming a stronger follower of Jesus. Fact of the matter is that a husband has an inescapable responsibility, guys, to lead. Uh, as such, there's only two options, right? We'll either lead biblically, we'll either lead well, or we'll lead poorly. But you, you can think what you want to think, but you're always leading. You're always leading, and that's by divine design. Oh, God, help us to lead biblically and lovingly. Um, so that's not a threat. That's actually, thank you that there's, thanks for keeping it simple. There's only two options. <laughs> I'm either going to be bad at this or I'm going to be godly at this. I'm going to be selfish at this or I'm going to be Christ-like at this. And God gives us every grace to be Christ-like. Adam's choice to disobey God, to, he, and so right there was abdication. There was the first instance of husbands abdicating. He abdicated his leadership role to indulge himself with the world. So I'm, I'm guessing that the, 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 the lies of the devil were starting to be as attractive to him too. You know, he stays silent. So I guess he's getting lured into the same thing, uh, but he's abdicating. He runs away from his responsibility and when pressed, <laughs> that blames Eve, right? So he's responsible, but even though he's responsible, he's blaming Eve. God holds him accountable. That's why I made a point of it during the, uh, the overview from Genesis to Revelation. Adam, where are you? There's accountability for this and how different the spiritual headship of Christ is. He was innocent of sin, yet he runs toward the cross. He runs to the fire. Like we talk about first responders, just listening to some of the reports from the shooting in Kansas City. And, and just to hear again, I'm so, so thankful for our police guys here. Man, Lord, thank you for people who actually run to the danger. Well, there was no better example of that than Jesus. He wasn't guilty. He had no sin. But he runs to the cross to bear it for us. You know, you know Adam says, that woman you gave me. Jesus says, that bride you gave me. You know, 
He's coming to save her. He's coming to redeem her. And that's a lifestyle, guys, that the Lord wants to weave into our hearts to be like Jesus. He was innocent of her of, of our sin, but he runs toward the fire. He runs and accepts responsibility for our sins as though he committed them in order to present us dressed in his complete righteousness. It's un- that news is never going to get old, is it? That's so amazing. So to love your wife as Christ loved the church is a willingness to let the buck stop with you in regard to the spiritual well-being of your family. Your wife has to give an account for her sins to God, but he's called you to be the steward of the spiritual health of your family. Um, So Adam, he's, you know, so that's the great contrast. That woman you gave me, she's the problem. She should be punished. I should be saved. And Christ doesn't say that. That church you gave me, I will be punished in her place and I'll be responsible for her spiritual well-being. I'll present her pure and spotless in all of her glory. 1 Corinthians 11.3 qualifies, this is in your notes, qualifies a husband leadership as accountable leadership. So look what he says. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Christ is under authority. It's imperative for your wife to recognize that like Christ, you too are a man under authority. Your submitting to Christ's authority makes her submitting to your authority much more inviting and inspiring. Again, I don't know any better way to invite your wife to follow you and to follow your leadership and to submit to you than by you modeling it by being a man under authority. Isn't that making, oh, I just don't know. Of course, you know, I'm I'm not a woman. I'm married to one. And I think she would say, I I even, somebody years ago told me to do this. I've done this. I've I've told Jan, um, you have my complete permission. If I'm sinning, and it's repetitive. It's repetitive, and it's hurting you. If it's hurting the boys, uh, if just if it just see me just getting harder in my heart to the Lord, I give you every permission to go talk to Alan and to Hugh. Run to them. If I'm not listening to you, run to them. How do you think that made her feel? I hope pretty good. I hope pretty good. Uh, versus, you, don't you say anything to those leaders. You guys, I've seen so many ugly things in 30 plus years of ministry. I've seen men just react. I mean, they they struggle to be accountable to their employer, let alone to spiritual leadership in the church. And and it always has a ripple effect upon the family. And so this unsubmitted man, he wonders why it's so hard for the wife to submit to him. Oh, but he demands it. Oh, my God. Repent, men for any times that we move in that direction. So can we have, so this is good because it's after lunch and bring a little lightheartedness to this, but a pretty good illustration. I need a husband and wife to help me with this next illustration. Brad and Amy, well, wait, Brad, Amy was, so that was awesome. Your willingness to volunteer is awesome. But Brad, this is what Amy was doing. While you were joyfully standing, Amy was doing this. Amy, it's, Oh, thank you guys. Could you welcome them? Can you help me bring these two chairs up here? Actually, you guys are great for this illustration. So this is this is about accountability um, and, and inviting a wife under the, the covering, under the, the accountability of a husband. Yes, please. Please come and sit in these chairs. So this is just a fun thing to do, but it always, oh man, this always gets me to my own heart to do this. So this is, this is a prayer shawl. This is called a tallit. Uh, so, you know, the Jews would use uh, for their own personal prayer times. Uh, it, you know, sadly it eroded into works righteousness and uh, even not even recognizing a lot of the meaning that it used to hold. But on Sabbath, it was kind of the cool thing. So here's what we would do, I'm trying to find the, uh, the corners here. Here we go. 
So on the Sabbath, right? So life would have lit the candles already, you know. And so even in the even in the picture of the Sabbath, God is already telling the wife, the sin of Eve is not ruined the call of a wife. You know, I'm going to redeem the call of a wife. So that the table is so sweet. It's a, there's a complimentary thing that goes on at that table. It's really beautiful. So the husband uh, during that that uh, Sabbath meal, he would take his prayer shawl, right, and so he would be putting it on his shoulders to begin with. Okay, so on the end of the shawl, there's something. It's, I think the spelling is T Z I T T T T, something like that. But it is a series of knots and windings. I wish I could show you this up close and personal. If you want to see it afterwards, you can come look at it. Um, if you were to add up each winding and each knot that's on the four corners of the shawl, it would add up to 613. Anybody know what that 613 is? The number of commandments in the Old Testament. So I want you to see what this, this was supposed to mean. What it's supposed to mean is a man who before he, before he can be the leader you need him to be, he's recognizing, oh, God, I, I need to be a man under the authority of God's word. I have an accountability to give here, Lord. So I want you to notice a lot of what's happening here through, through spiritual leadership, through spiritual headship. But then how are you doing with those 613 commandments, Brad? <laughs> Can we get somebody else up here? Um, not, not well. Oh man, how are we do? How are we doing with ten? Right? I, I, if we could reduce it to one, we would not be any better than Adam, right? I mean, it just—he, Adam, was our governmental head. He was our federal head, and he represented all of us. Um, so we're not—we're more familiar with all the commandments we're breaking, aren't we? man, I'm a commandment breaker. I'm supposed to have spiritual leadership. I'm supposed to be a representative of God's love to my wife. What is there to do? That's so cool. So he would recognize that there's got to be a covering. There's got to be an intermediary. There's got to be some, some way that the lawbreaker can become covered, that his sins could be covered. And so let's see how you're looking. I'm looking good, man. You're looking good. Yeah. Looking pretty good. Like here, look, if I get in here with you, look. Like the See, this, look, I'm going to really look Middle Eastern now. Like Don't I look more Middle Eastern like this, you know? <laughs> Casey's just going, no, you just look weird. Yeah, but that, so, so now look what's happening. It's, and so you're watching this. The kids are all around this table. <sighs> See, I just... <sighs> and now dad is confessing his sins. Yeah. He's repenting. And he's, he knows, I, I need a redeemer. I need somebody to forgive me of all this. I, I need a covering. I need, I, need, I need somebody that is my intermediary. It, 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 it was going to be Jesus, right? That's where, sadly, we just start fixating on instruments that were supposed to point us to Jesus, and we just stop and we worship the shawl. <laughs> or we, you know, but anyway, but isn't this so beautiful? Because we know... Promise made, promise kept in Jesus. So you're watching this. The kids are watching this. The next thing that happens is now as a man under authority and a man who recognizes he needed redemption. Now here's what he did. He would say, sweetheart, would you come under this with me? Now, ladies, how hard would this be to do if that's what is going on in your husband's heart? How hard is it to follow this kind of leader? I mean, there's still we're still sinners, right? So we can still have our own bad days and we can still have our own sinful dispensation or dis, whatever the word is. Um, yeah, because we don't believe in that. Anyway, that's a theological thing. Yeah, so, um, but isn't it, oh my goodness, of course I want to come under this covering, because you know that you need to be a woman under authority. You need a redeemer for your sins. And isn't it great that your husband is, is initiating? Then, he, you know, there's not, he's not, doesn't have to, he's not controlling the whole world. That's not what leadership is. But he's initiating this 
gospel reminder daily. That's what a man's supposed to do. Just the initiator. And then you're going to bring things to the table that the Lord's putting on your heart to bless him and bless the kids. So at this point, so my grandfather uh, was from Damascus. And so he, he was, in, uh, I, don't, I wish I would have known how he, why he wasn't a Muslim. He, he was, uh, he grew up in the Arabic Orthodox church. And so he was a chanter, you know, so he played an Arabic guitar it's called an oud, which is just a chubby guitar. I just call it, I don't know what, what to call it. Um, and so he would, like, there was one time, I just remember when I was a little boy, we went to the church and my grandfather chanted. It was, it was that, that Middle Eastern sounding kind of a thing. Well, that's what the husband would do. He would sing over his wife. Okay. And so, so often it would be like a Proverbs 31, you know, an excellent wife who can find. Her worth is above all the jewels in the world. You know, can you imagine your kids? <laughs> can you imagine sitting here? You see what mom and dad's doing? This is awesome. Don't you get in a little picture of the gospel according to marriage happening here? You know, it was just the sweetest thing ever. And so that that was a, a weekly observance, right? So I'm not encouraging. I'm not saying that. Oh, let's so let's all go do that. I'm not saying that. This is a dis, this is the disposition of our hearts. We want this to be lived out in real time with our devotional life and with our commitment to local church and our appreciation that the God gives gifts to the church and He's given you as gifts to the church. And so there's this beautiful thing about being under authority, being under accountability, recognizing the need for mercy, giving mercy to each other. It's, it's, isn't it exciting? You know, the most exciting thing about this illustration is I get to do this. So this is your reward oh, for doing this. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to close the door. Okay. Now go ahead and smooch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for the hair. I, I never, I don't know how, I should, I guess I could give you little, yeah. <laughs> can you guys thank them for helping me with that? I don't think we need them. Yeah, we can leave them. Le no, we can leave them here. Yeah, yeah, there's one more thing if we have time to do, we'll do. Um, I just think that just, that just always affects my heart. You know, am I making it easy for Jan to come under my authority? Does she see that I'm a man that is accountable? And I'm, I present my heart to other men in terms of my spiritual development. Um, so don't be surprised if your wife struggles to submit if you are not submitted. And yet, ladies, you, you can't base it on them. Your act of submission is an act of worship to Jesus not a statement of deserving. And it's not a, this a statement that I'll submit if you deserve it, right? So we'll talk about that in the ladies' session some more. Then he goes on, he says, a husband's love for a wife is sacrificial. So he says, husbands, love your wives. Let me just stop right there. Men, quick question. What's the motive of love? Simple answer. Ladies, what's the motive of love? Somebody said it. Say it louder. Love. The motive of love is love. Biblically, it is. It's not, I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back. Husbands, love your wives. And here's, and here's the motive, insp inspiration for the motive, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So the first thing to notice from the text is how this, the overarching commands for husbands and wives that God is giving them at the specific place where we struggle with our fallenness. So instead of loving self, instead of giving into the sin that happened in the garden, God is giving redemptive power so that we can love and love her instead of loving ourselves. Uh, and so one word really summarizes that and it's love, but what kind of love? Well, as Christ loved the church. So the phrase can be understood as sentimental. And, and ladies, I think sometimes, I think that's what, we, what you can kind of gravitate to. You just feel like you need more sentiment from your husband. Sentiment's great. May that happen. But pray more for his covenant commitment. Pray more that he'd grow in covenant. And out of that covenant would flow the sentiment. Sent, sentiment feel, sentimental feelings of love are wonderful, but they cannot be foundational 
this isn't sentimental love primarily. This is sacrificial and covenantal love. A Christ-like husband consistently remembers the agony of Christ as he suffered on the cross for our sins. This is what love means, sacrifice, sacrifice for her godliness, for her godliness. Um, he sacrificed for our denying him, abandoning him, betraying him, finding satisfaction in something else besides him. Uh, he sees Christ's love for his bride because he stayed on the cross. So one of the things we're learning in marriage is the reason God hates divorce. So let me qualify that. If you've been divorced, great news. God loves the divorced. He loves the divorced, but he hates divorce. So now let's think, let's thank God for the cross. Let's, if any, if any of the stuff from our past that needed to be forgiven and all that kind of stuff, isn't it great? It's forgiven. It's forgiven. So now we're looking to the future. God hates divorce because it tells a lie about Jesus. It misrepresents Jesus, who said one of the best, one of the best verses for the security of our hearts ever is, I will never leave you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm not going to put up, just put up with you. I'll stay with you. <laughs> I'm so glad. I didn't say, I'll stay with you. I'll put up, I'll, I'll put up with you. No, no, it's always continuing this love, love, love for our spiritual well-being. Um, so he stayed on the cross even while it was hard so that he could give us grace to stay true and committed to our wives for a lifetime. Um, that's how Christ-like husbands sacrificially love their wives for the glory of God. Uh, this is in your notes. A husband's uh, a husband must learn to define sacrifice as it is defined in Christ. It's not mere self-denial now in order to get what you want later. So don't confuse that. It's a commitment to lay down his life at any cost and for as long as necessary for the spiritual welfare of his life. I think, guys, we've got to see sacrifice not as just individual actions, but as an attitude of heart and a way of life. Do you understand what I'm saying there? I think we pat ourselves on the back because three years ago, do you know what I gave up for you? <laughs> you know, or these, these instances, and we call attention to them because I guess they're so fr infrequent. You know, we call attention to, oh, the sacrifices we've made. I don't think God's, like, like to forgive. What is God most wanting to do in us in forgiveness? Is he most wanting you just to forgive at that moment, just for that thing? Or is he wanting to say, I so want to change your heart. I want you to be a forgiver. That's your lifestyle. You're not even leaving yourself an option of not forgiving because Jesus didn't leave himself an option of not forgiving. That's, I think that, I think so many of the Christians, you know, the, the, he was, so wanting us, you know, in the, the Corinthian series, first Corinthian series, some grace has come out with what we, it's called the seven shaping virtues. So we have seven shared values, but the doctrines that we believe in, if they're not resulting in the change of our hearts, we're missing it, right? And I think this is very true about something like this, that God doesn't want to just help give us grace to make one good decision every now and then. I think he said, I want to make you like me. I want, I want you to be patient, not as just a moment in time. I want to make you patient because you're a patient person. That's what my transforming grace does. I, I want you to be not just forgiving individual sins. I want you to become a forgiver. I don't want you just to lay your life down every now and then. I want you to get up in the morning. And one of the glories that you want God to have is that today, God, show me. Show me today afresh. How can I love her sacrificially today? And, and, and you don't come out in the very practical kind of things, but oh Lord, um, this morning I just was reading another good book. I don't think we we put it out. Uh, Kevin DeYoung wrote a book on men, women in the church, and uh, uh, this is what he says about. Let me see here, sacrifice. Let me get that. It's just so good. Husbands, sacrifice for your wives. Perhaps the most important thing for your marriage is that you understand the doctrine of the atonement. <laughs> These things hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm going, oh my goodness. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, if you were to say, okay, 
uh, you've been married 10 years and, and so you guys are coming to the 10 year couple and saying, Hey, Hey, what do we most need to know about marriage? There'd be so many things. It'd be so easy to tell, right? One of the things I remember most of our premarital counseling was one counseling session of, and it was how to fight. <laughs> that was, that's a, pretty much what I took out of our counseling session. Um, how do you think we're doing with that? <laughs> well, it's because you win most of the time. But, um, oh, gosh. What would be the most important? What, if you, what is the most important thing? To know the cross. That's it. You want to get married? You know one of the ways you prepare? Know the cross. I, I love what he's saying here. Understand the doctrine of atonement. Jesus died for the church. Your leadership as a husband is a self-sacrificing leadership. This can mean little things. Coming home early, taking care of the kids, participating joyfully in something she likes to do. Overlooking an offense, running errands, fixing something around the house, cleaning up the house. Loving your wife can also entail bigger sacrifices. You may need to forfeit climbing the corporate ladder in order to be a decent husband. You may be called upon to give up your hopes and dreams in order to take care of your wife after she falls ill or is injured. You may sacrifice the big house or the best neighborhood and live at a lower lifestyle so your wife can stay home with the kids. This is Chris Ostom said this. This was so good. He said, yea, even if it shall be needful for thee to give thy life for her, yea, this is all the, you know, yea, he's not cheering, <laughs> yea, yea, listen guys, and to be cut into pieces 10,000 times, yea, and to endure and undergo any suffering whatsoever, refuse it not, though you should undergoest all of this, yet wilt thou not, no, not even then, have done anything like Christ. <clears throat> know the cross, you too. Know the cross. Uh -huh. So that's that. So definition of sacrificial love. How are we doing? How are we doing? Okay. Um, Christ-like love of a husband is transformational, that he might sanctify her. Um, so in a way, guys, there's this, this realm where we are responsible for her growth and godliness, for her growth and holiness. So the greatest gift I think you can give your wife is your own devotion to the Lord and your own pursuit of sanctification. So you can inspire hers. Piper and Grudem put it this way. Covenant leadership recognizes that the call to leadership is a call to personal growth and holiness, repentance and humility. Um, the responsibility Christ bore at the cross for his bride's salvation continues as he supplies grace for her sanctification. So he's always about our godly good, and we need to be asking God for those kind of eyes and that kind of heart. So do you know, so how are you doing? Um, First Peter says to live your, with your wives in an understanding way, which means you're studying them. You, you need to be an expert at your wife. You need to be an expert, not only what she's going through, you need to be growing in your knowledge of what God wants for her life in scripture. And so uh, <laughs> essentially we said, uh, when I got married to Jan, I entered the University of Jan and I'm never going to graduate. That's a good thing. I'm, yeah, I'm a dumb guy, but it's a good thing that I get to study my wife and until I go to the Lord or she goes to the Lord. So things like this. Um, what's your wife reading lately? Does, does your wife have friendships that help her grow in Christ? What are her spiritual gifts? And is she using them? Uh, what are her fears? What are her hopes? What are her dreams? You're, we're not just trying to seek to meet current needs, but in prayer and understanding scripture, what are her future needs? Can I anticipate as much as God would let me? Can I even anticipate her future needs? This is all, this takes time and, and it takes sacrifice and it takes a focus on her spiritual well being. Communication is huge. Draw her out, ask her these kind of questions. Uh, and then, can you talk? Can you talk to your wife about an area where she needs to grow without her feeling overwhelmed with your correction? That's a learned art, I think. It's a very, it's very patient. It's knowing God has to change the heart. It's wanting to inspire that change. 
But I, I, I think that's really easy. It's easy for pastors to do, to, to bring a word of correction. And yet you just leave the person overwhelmed, not pointed to the cross and forgiveness and the power of the spirit to change. And is she growing in her spiritual disciplines? Is, her, is she growing stronger in her identity in Christ and not confusing that identity with the calling of motherhood or the vocation she's called to? Are you giving time to cultivate friendships with other godly women? Are you letting her rest? Are you giving her Sabbaths? Things that she could just take time and focus on the Lord. He cleanses her by the washing of the water with the word. God's word, God's word is the primary means of transforming us. And this is another one where it's really gentle. The, the washing of water is, so think of when your kids are either babies or those of you who are, are in the baby stage. You know, you, you don't even put the, baby in the bathtub you put him in this little thing you can take see how long it's been since we've been at that stage what is it called just a bassinet a, a water bassinet is there such a thing a bath bassinet oh it's a little tub see i'm just not good with technical phrases a little tub so so do you do i mean it doesn't isn't it isn't it fun to grow with your kid just even in, the, in their bathing you know as they're getting older because when they're that age, right? I mean, you're using no tears stuff, right? And but you're so you're so careful. You're cleansing, but you're so careful. You're so careful. Then they get in the bathtub, and it's all, <laughs> you know. Husbands, that's what the that's what the word is saying. You bring the word with gentleness. You don't want to overwhelm her. You want to inspire her. You want to know what she's going through. One bit of scripture for one bit of life. Your wife doesn't need a, 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 oh, a book. She doesn't need to just give her a book. Just one bit of scripture for one bit of life. Small seeds grow big trees, right? So we don't have to be just you know seminary graduates to do that. Share with her what you're reading in the scriptures. And then Christ-like love promises a future that prepares her to see Christ. This is, I've got, to, I've got to stop. You've got the rest of the notes, but let's do this. So Parker and Brooke, can you help me with this? Gary, can you help me with this? We're going to, I, I want, you didn't know we we're going to have a wedding today, did you? <laughs> so Brooke, I want to introduce you to your dad. So we're going to have a little wedding rehearsal here. So would you two go to the back of the room? Come on up here with me, my buddy. Didn't know it was going to come this fast, did you? Man, that flew by, didn't it? That just flew by. But this is a way cheaper way of doing it, right? This is... I tried to convince her. You tried to. <laughs> So be thinking about this. Remember that. So the husband is mindful that he's not just looking at today. He's not just looking at the next few years. He raises his eyes to see God's smiling face and promise of glory. And the fact that he wants to give rewards when we see him so that we can take those rewards and cast them at his feet as acts of worship. You know. So ready? Who gives this? I'm going to get mushed out. <laughs> this happens every time I do a wedding. I just met you guys. <laughs> okay. It's pretend. It's pretend. Who gives this woman to be wed? Your father. And so look what we do here. Oh, this, that was so sweet, honey. Go ahead and go and step down here. Okay. He's entrusted this bride to you, right? And and so it's so crazy. Our weddings nowadays are so childish. <laughs> Just there's anyway. Don't have to explain everything. <sighs> it's just so easy to be okay. So exciting. We're married. 
I pronounce you husband and wife, but remember the pastor is not joining you together. God himself, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do on your wedding day. As you get ready to leave the room, okay, don't just be thinking about the reception. Don't just be thinking about the pictures. Your journey goes far beyond that day. Your hand-holding goes far beyond that day. Ben, would you, would you be God? <laughs> so go back over by the door. Go back a little further over. Oh, how about right there, right there, right there. That's good, that's good. So this is where your marriage journey goes, right? The most important thing now that you'll do is preparing her for that day. So go ahead and start taking her, take, walk her all the way home, my son. Walk her all the way home. Because this is our, this is our mission, man. This is our mission. And on that day, and again, this falls, you know, because, just, but you see the visual, right? So now, just as her father put her hand in yours, now you put her hand in her heavenly father. That's the gospel according to marriage. Amen. Can you guys thank everybody for doing that? So uh, we need to stop there. You know, the husband's love is incarnational. And maybe I can just send you my, my manuscript from that portion on just to, uh, so we won't have time to get that. But I hope. A lot of that was communicated. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being husbands. Don't deserve it. We do not deserve it. Highest honor of our life is to have the privilege of representing Jesus to the precious women that you've called to be our wives. From this day forward, God, help us to grow in the grace of the gospel according to marriage. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Eric, you want to give the announcement? You're just 10 minute? Yeah, start at two. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll get back for the conclusion. Okay. Guys, thank you so much. You're being so good.